just not be eating enough bean pies no more. I think he stopped. Dude. Have you had a have you had a bean pie lately? <laughs> Hey, like bean pies. hey, you in LA now? You can just go to the place over there where we was going to with the all bean the time. Pies. I can, yeah, I ain't did it yet, but oh no, them, but them, he was lying though. Those was not bean pies. They were sweet, sweet potato, potato pies. Those were sweet, sweet, sweet potato pies. They were sweet potato, they were sweet potato, potato pies. pies. The people was lying to us. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was. They had bean, but they also had sweet potato. They gave us sweet potato. I don't know, Paris. This that bean. <laughs> Brothers, brothers, what's going on, man? It's uh, it's it's it's, it's uh, Black History Month, really. Yeah, it's Black, Black History. History every day, but it's Black History Month. How y'all brothers doing today? Well, thank you. Hey, it's it's a blessing, man. It's a blessing. We here for another show, here for another day. Most importantly, and here for another year. Let's get it. Okay. Jeff got that. Jeff, you got your hair cut. He mean died? No, I did. You know what? Me and Cindy was talking about this. And we're going to do a whole process and show y'all how just because my hair is thinning, I ain't got to cut my hair off yet. Because y'all think I didn't spray it, all this stuff. We're about to show y'all. We're about to stun on y'all. We're going to show how it is. That little picture y'all took, we're going to start there. Then we're going to show how she blended. Shout out to my barber. We got something special coming on Instagram real soon for the haters of respect. It. We got well, something. What about, so look at this picture of yourself right here. And then behind you, like the beard is two different beards. Like it's, 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 the beard. The, it's, it, it, the beard is artificial, but, you need <laughs> but it's okay though. It's okay. The beard is a little artificial, but ain't okay. nobody gonna tell me that Rick Ross, Rick Ross's beard is still black and he like fifty. I know, I know, I know, I know. So why no, no. I ain't even? I got the, actually got hair. I don't bean. have a hair. That cocoa bean. Yeah, but see, this is my thing. If it was just all gray, I would do it. But it's patchwork, and you know what I'm saying. I'm still trying to. Hey, well, it's a perfect time, you know, um, for us to engage in a discussion. But obviously, you know, for our viewers, they're like, okay, well, we we added the members to the committee today. So I'm going to let Tav go ahead and, and let everybody know who we have with us today, our special guest. So today's special guest is a uh, very important to the framework of my career, the beginning of my career, um, because he's got so many things that he does, so many things and so many ways that he's impactful. I'm going to go ahead and let him introduce his whole self so that he gets it right and I don't want to mess it up. And for somebody who has such a profound impact on the beginning of, well, yeah, kind of like the beginning of my career, I want to make sure he gets his proper dues. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ernest. Um, I work for a moderate size agency in the in the Bay Area. Uh, up until recently, I was responsible for personnel recruiting and training for that particular law enforcement agency. So basically my job was to go out, recruit, hire, train uh, new officers coming into the uh, law enforcement community and into the police force. And it was very important for me personally, being a man of color, that I went out there and, and looked for and hired people of color to represent the community that I currently work in, and even try to get people who currently live in the community come work for the agency as well. A little tougher uh, on that aspect, but I think overall, and Taft can attest to this, um, the people that I, were, I was able to actually hire on during my tenure in the in that unit um, definitely reflected myself, him, people in the community, and uh, are going to do great things at that agency. Good stuff. Definitely. Thank you again, too. Like I said, uh, responsible for making sure I got one of my first big bags. So I appreciate that very much. And you know what? The way things go and the way people, you know, sometimes are and the way people sometimes deal with me, you never know when I might need to come back. So <laughs> I appreciate you very much for uh, keeping me in a safe space for those situations that may cause me to have to weigh my options. Um, fair enough. Nah, that's just no the importance of never burning your bridges, right? Like, Amen. you never know when you have to circle back in a situation with somebody that you've 
been involved with or worked with previously, you know, maintaining relationships. I think that's important. That's a key to development in your career, period. Really in life is maintaining relationships, mm-hmm. healthy relationships, like staying in contact with people, you know, abiding a friend out, you know, to have a drink or for a meal that even though y'all not still connected in that space, that has helped you along the way, reaching back and telling people that, you know, I'm grateful or thank you. And this kind of leads into our discussion today. You know, obviously for those who are tuned in with the sports world, they have seen or witnessed uh, what's going on with the NFL and coach Brian Flores. And he's basically suing them, essentially saying that they have discriminated against his ability to, or not just him, but other African-Americans, ability to maintain coaching jobs, not only to get those jobs, but to maintain them, basically saying, hey, we're not giving the opportunities, you know, it's a 70% African-American league, and we're not giving the opportunities to lead these young men. So you're saying we can run the ball and, 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 and tackle for you, but we can never be in leadership positions. So it made us start to think for the brothers here, when in our different careers and the different spaces we work in, do we see a lot of discrimination or, you know, what are some of the things that we've had to overcome in order to get to the positions we are? You know, P is the vice president of a, of a university. You know, that's a that's a that's a high position within a school. So when you think about in order for P to be there, what things that, you know, P and other brothers and the brothers on this um, on this call today had to overcome in order to get to where they are? Yeah, I mean, for my I, I let me say it this way for in education it took the voices of not only those that were in those various positions, but also of the people who are attending those institutions to say, Hey, I want leadership that looks like me. So that was one thing I think in education, uh, it was a united voice. So you had people constantly needing and wanting that change. Um, now can that transfer into other areas? I mean, they can, but it has to take somebody want to do that sacrifice in order to do so in the football analogy. That means players have to take that sacrifice like, no, we need people who look like me and we're not going to stand for it unless that changes. So it's a different dynamic for that to take place. But in education, it took it took a unified push for that to for that to change. I think, man, I mean, as now I don't work for anybody, but when I worked for this, <laughs> when I worked for like the Department of Family Protective Services, it was one of them things that were, it was a lot of aging. So I cut this gray beard off. I look like I'm 19 or 20 years old. I'm 37. So when you're trying to go on up that, like you talked about that glass, it was like, who's this young dude? What does he, what does he bring to the table? What does he know about telling somebody how to raise a kid or this, that, and the other, um, that not knowing my age or my resume or whatever it is, they just see me offhand as we are men of color. We all, we look younger than we actually are. So they, they see you first off like, man, what do you bring? Instead of letting me, bring my expertise to the table, giving me the interview. Like Flores, like I get the interview, but the interview's a sham. It's just a checkoff, right? They like they interview me, but it's really when the interview. They had somebody in place already. You know what I'm saying? That they thought could, could that was qualified or whatever they thought, or they buddy or whatever you want to call it, to get that job. And I right. think the problem is now, especially like with the NFL is, and I didn't even say it's a problem, it's just human nature. If I get on, y'all get on. And I think that's the NFL thing is like, if I get a job, all my boys going to get a job. And I think that's the thing about it is because there's no owners that are that look like us, they're not going to put people in place to look like us. So that's the issue, really. I think it's the ownership. Not so much like the coaching. It's, it's an issue, but the ownership is the issue because they do the hiring. Yeah, I would say, too, just um, looking at all the different aspects that we could talk about right now when it comes to this is that um, – you know, in these practices, these hiring practices that we've saw, yeah, we've seen people have a buddy system that allows you to have a, a blanket or a diaper over your ass when you shit the bed, so to speak, right? And I would say that um, we're not afforded that opportunity in life, um, let alone, you know, I, as we're watching the NFL, coaches are saying, you don't win, you get fired. Mike Tomlin ain't around because he got losing seasons. Mike Tomlin never loses, you know, he has that's the only choice that he has in life is to win every day. And I would say that how that kind of breaks into what we're going to talk about today, you know, is um, in any field that we go into where there's older black mentorship, older minority mentorship, and you are the minority in that field, the pressures to feel like you have to show up, work better, be better from the day of the interview process still exist. And it's like, there's no, there's no, if we all need you to get on, or I mean, we all gonna make sure that you safe when you get on and stuff like that. It's 
you told even by your peers, your other black peers, you better perform because this is the situation that we're in. So really, I guess is like, man, is it really that universal in every field? And then also, you know, why is it like that in every field? Or why does it appear to be like that in every field for all of us? Why do we have that feeling? Well, I can I can tell you that it also to kind of piggyback on that. We're given less benefit of the doubt, you know, when we're trying to get the job and when you do get the job. Like so trying to get the job in my industry, if you have a couple of hiccups along the way in your mm-hmm. youth, it's gonna be held against you at a higher rate than if you were someone of non color. Like, yeah, I made a mistake. I was a college knucklehead. I, you know, got a couple of, you know, you know, public intoxication type deals. For me, that's all bad. But for someone who doesn't look like me, it might be just chalked up as youthful exuberance, right? But <laughs> I'm making poor life choices. Youthful <laughs> exuberance. So they gonna hold, they gonna hold that against me and make it a little more difficult for me to get my foot in the door. And just not give me the benefit of that doubt. Vice versa. Once I get the job, you know. Lord forbid I get into a you know vehicle collision while I'm working. Well, you know, just a little paint transfer, no big deal. But I'm me. So maybe I don't get the same benefit that the next dude gets or woman gets because they don't necessarily look like me. So it, there's a lot of that. And then there's all like I call I call it the friends and family discount. You know, the nepotism thing is real. It's real, mm-hmm. real. So it really don't matter what you qualifications are your background might be if you know somebody who knows somebody who's willing to advocate for you oh come on in man here you go <laughs> here the keys here's a notepad <laughs> go, go out and do your thing so i hear what you're saying yeah definitely benefit of the doubt and that nepotism thing is for real yeah no, i don't know if I, go ahead my bad Pete. i was gonna say it's funny how we're still tying those uh them knots together so jeff you started off about how people approaching their look. Ernest even said, hey, as I've been hiring people, I kept on looking at people that was like me and trying to, you know, hire from within that community. And the last thing, as we were talking about the football, the analogy that comes to my mind that everybody has been sharing and tying these all together is what's that tree? So that's another thing. So you're talking about hiring people. If you can't really, even though Mike Tomlin is winning, 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 he still ain't having the ability to hire some hire somebody that look like him to start creating that tree that Ernest is now talking about of I reach out to people that look like me so I can continue that 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 cycle of hiring people that are of like minded, like the same as dealing with that community. So it's funny that all those things are one connected different ways, but they're still connected. Right. One thing that happened, I don't know if you remember this, like in like 29, 2009, 2010, Oakland did. They changed their qualifications to be a firefighter. Right. So I went to school for firefighting. I went to school for some other stuff, too. So I had two degrees. Right. So I'm like, oh, my God. Man, get, sign me up, right? So I get out there. There's literally probably 30,000 people standing outside, right? So the lady comes down from the top, from the building to pick people, right? So she's picking like, you, 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 just based on how you look. You, 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 you. Guess who she picked? Her son. Right? <laughs> she picks her son out of the group, too. So what happens is, Uncle was like, they found out, people found out, was like, oh, no, you got you to take every applicant that turns into application. Because they found out she picked her son out of all the people that was in that group, too. Um, that was, I was like, it opened my eyes. Like, <laughs> that's crazy, right? It's 30 <laughs> other people out here. You found your son out of all these people that I was like, crazy. He I, that, 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 that oh. journey is crazy because Jeff, a lot of people don't, don't know about that story, right? Like, you know, yeah. you have a bachelor's degree and then you went back to school to get all the qualifications in the, the, um, um, ambulance that's degree nice. and all that degree yeah. to be, to be a firefighter and, as in, in in your own state, your home state, record clear, ain't got nothing on your record, no issues, no nothing, as well as having a bachelor's degree and, and wasn't able to get a degree. So that's crazy. That's right. Oh, no. I, I don't know what the hell is going on in my phone. <laughs> perfect time. I don't know oh, what's no. going on. Oh, no, 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 but, no, no, no. But wasn't able to get, wasn't able to get a, 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 a job, right? Right. right. You know, no, to serve crazy. to serve your community. Right. So they, they talked about a lot of diversity. Like in, even in the interviews, bro, I literally went from Sacramento. We, well, I was in Sacramento, down with San Jose. I literally went up the coast. I went from Sacramento all the way to LA. I wasn't doing wildfire. I was doing city. So I, I applied everywhere. Right. And when I say everywhere, I got a bachelor's degree, a degree of fire science. I got my EMT. Right. I'm only at the time like 24 years old. So I'm applying everywhere. I got the little thing to show that I'm physically fit. You got to do all this little obstacle course in 10 minutes, all that jazz. Right. I got all that. And then, uh, 
you get to the captain's interview, or whatever, and I never make it past that point. That's it for me. But I know guys that I went to school with, 18, 19, 20, that, that skin ain't the same color as mine. Boom. Push through. They in San Jose. San Jose at that time, 08, that's six figures out the gate. They, you know what I'm saying? Boom. All right, cool. Concord is not, not as much. Uh, all these different places, they get these jobs. I'm like, what is going on? Like, I apply literally to the same places. I got the degrees. I got everything, everything they need. But I just didn't have an OG or somebody that was in the field. Like, it's not many men of color that are in the area that can be like, all right, let me grab the young boy and bring him in. And for us, it's just sad. You know what I'm saying? I it just didn't uh, happen for me like it did, luckily, for Taff or some other guys. Well, that's what I wanted to talk about. And, I, I mean, I kind of wanted to get Ernest to kind of navigate this for us and see where this conversation can go. I remember applying for this particular agency that ultimately I ended up getting a job with um, and him being, you know, instrumental in hiring me. But uh, I remember taking that physical agility test that morning and getting told, all right, cool. You, you got an interview in like an hour and a half from now. And luckily for me, I had, you know, family that didn't live too far um, out of the area. So I was able to go and put on a suit in a, in a bathroom, um, put on a tie and come back and interview. Um, and obviously I must have interviewed well because we know the story ends when we get in there. But um, there wasn't everybody wasn't prepared to interview that day that went in took those physical agility tests and got interview slots like myself and all of those people it, that didn't go and put, I mean, and I mean, there were people that went in there to go and do their interviews that didn't wear suits. Like it was like, Oh, because you really technically don't get enough time to go and get a suit. Not unless you've kind of prepared yourself to be yeah. like, if it's going to go down today, I got everything with me and I'm ready for it. Right. I just so happened to be kind of ready for it because I was doing my homework ahead of time through ride alongs, all types of stuff to prepare for this opportunity. So long story short, um, knowing that all of these things could happen, I was ready to go. But there were people in there that weren't prepared as I was that took that same oral board interview in front of captains and lieutenants in sweats and beat up Nikes. And they didn't think twice about it. They didn't even trip like, oh, yeah, I don't have enough time to get this suit together, this and that. They just was like, this is how I'm rocking. And to me, it was like, no, I get one shot to make one impression. And it doesn't matter that I just ran and did all of this. I have to come in this room as if you guys just called me from my house and I just put on a tailored suit. And so I guess what I'm saying is that that pressure from being a young black applicant or a young minority applicant, because it's not just about, I think, black in the situation, it's minorities in general. Is that pressure real that I felt? Uh, um, Ernest, if you could speak to that, like I felt that was real. like, is that pressure and getting myself prepared like that, even knowing everything that I know, is that a real thing that exists in our culture or something that people take for granted and be like, man, I ain't about to do all that. How do you see it from your seat? No, I, you know, I think you're right. The, pre the pressure is definitely real for uh, applicants of color. Um, as soon as you walk through the door to uh, drop off your applicant, you know, your paperwork and sit down and start working on the writing sample, you kind of, the, the, the interview started then, right? How you greet the human resources analyst or the sergeant or lieutenant, whoever happens to be running the test, all of that is uh, you're already starting to get like kind of put in category, so to speak, and you're getting weighed against all the other people that, that showed up. And, and then it also comes down to like, did the person pay attention to the instructions that were given, you know, prior to the, the testing process? Because with the, what, you know, Taps is speaking on, we did do that. We, we we rushed things to get the process moving faster, to get people in the process faster. So we were doing everything in one day. But everybody knew that. So some people, like Taft, came prepared with the change of clothes and some deodorant sticks and some toothpaste so that they could, you know, you know, after the, you know, getting all sweaty, they could go freshen up and be ready for the interview. But everybody knew that the interview was going to take place at some point during that day. So those who weren't prepared, unfortunately, weren't prepared. And I think that's where... Uh, we, we kind of fail one another um, because there's no, like, there's no workshops, like, for young African-Americans or people of color in general to go, this is how you prepare yourself to show up for an interview. I don't care if you're interviewing for McDonald's or if you're interviewing for IBM. This is how you get prepared. You should look, look this way, have this paperwork in your possession, and be prepared to answer these questions and done some research on the organization 
in which you're interviewing for. So that that was one of the things that I started to do and I tapped and kind of speak to that. I'll reach out to the folks who are coming in and go, hey, listen, interviews this day, be prepared to talk about this, 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 and this, and they're going to ask you some of this, this, and that, whatever, and look your best. <laughs> so you know that when you get show up, because we do, you walk in a room and if you've had opportunity to prepare and you got on a shirt with no tie, we're going to look at you sideways. Like you didn't come in prepared. And unfortunately, especially with this younger generation, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like Bias. I don't know what it is, but they showing up with print colored shirts and horizontal checkered blazers and no tie on. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? This is blue suit, white shirt, you know what I'm saying? Floral print tie. Just keep it real concerned, unfortunately. But that's what you have to do in order to get past that first level. Because um, once you get past the first level, then you need an advocate and somebody to kind of really walk you through the process and help you deal with some of the minor issues that may be in your background. But the pressure is real. You have to be better than everyone else that showed up that day. Um, I can use myself as an example, and I don't mean to take up too much time, but I just recently was promoted, right? So there was a process for that. There's a written exam that I had to pass. Then from there, I got to go interview, and it's three separate interviews with three people on each interview panel, and each subject or topic is completely different. And I'm up against everybody who's also assessing that don't necessarily look like me. I have to be the best person they see that day. <clears throat> when I walk out of the room, whoever walks in next, I want them comparing that person to me. Going here, he wasn't as good as Ernest. Yeah, he. So he, I'm gonna score him. He wasn't good as Ernest when he, he. Yeah, that wasn't as good. And you have to do that when you when you're a person of color. You gotta walk out the room and leave the chair on fire. Period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's crazy the things that people have to go through, or particularly us, we have to go through to put ourselves in a situation. I think y'all being kind of kind and generous, right, to say that some of these chances don't work out because you don't know somebody in the system, but some of these chances don't work out simply because they don't want you in the system, right? I think that, you know, in Jeff's situation, also in Tab's situation, you know, applying throughout the whole California and can't get on. You see um, people out here, particularly where in Texas, Ernest, and you know, they, they have signs and billboards now hiring, you know, now looking, looking for, you know, people within law enforcement bad. And I have people that I say, Hey man, this department is hiring, go down there and apply, you know, and people come back and say, man, when I got denied, well, why'd you get denied? Oh man. I, they found out, man, I had a, um, a, a, a ticket from 2010 that I forgot to pay, you know, something like that, something simple to where, you know, um, I have clients that are in law enforcement, man, that they 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 went in with a DUI, <laughs> you know what I mean? That obviously were, you know, Caucasian. They were not they were not black. So that's part of it. It's sometimes people don't want us in certain systems. I'll never forget. I, I work for myself and I've been in private practice for 11 years. So I haven't really had to deal with too many situations um, with applying for jobs because I've worked for myself for the last 11 years. But when I was, um, I applied to work at a county jail as a therapist. They needed a, a therapist. Now, this is a situation where the the medical staff was reaching out to me, Ernest, to like say, "Hey, we we need you. We need your help. Come help us." Okay, so I applied for the job. Interview great, and I get denied. I'm like, I got I got denied. They didn't hire me. The girl reached out. I was like, "Oh yeah, we can't push forward with the application." I'm like, "Why?" She's like, "You have." A, um, a ticket that's unpaid that turned into a warrant from 2007. Mind you, this is like 2015, 2016. I'm like, right. a ticket for a warrant? But I understood I had to get security clearance in here, right? I, I'm going to be working in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in a prison. I'm going to have access to all type of stuff, so I have to get the security clearance. But I ended up getting it taken care of. They gave me like a week to take care of it, and I ended up getting it smoothed out and got the job. Now, imagine what would have happened had they not really wanted me. Imagine if I was just a regular person applying for that job and it wasn't a situation where they were trying to come and recruit me. I would have been just, you know, thrown away, not given an opportunity because of something that happened almost 10 years ago at that time. And I think sometimes the process when hiring people of color, people are so quick to judge 
and not be curious. So they choose judgment over curiosity. Hey, man, talk to me about what happened in 2007 with this ticket that you never took care of. Maybe because like most people that have those random tickets, they forgot. They didn't know they had it. They didn't pulled over several times. Nobody ever said, hey, you know, you have a ticket. So I think sometimes those are also the situations. No one willing to pull you aside and say, hey, why you didn't get this job? And I love that Flores put that in his lawsuit saying, hey, we want a little more transparency about why certain people aren't getting jobs. Because it always seems to be us in no matter what industry, you know, mental health, education, finance, regardless of what industry it is, it's always that 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 African-American who seems to be overqualified on paper, but for some reason can't get the job. And they always go to the subjective thing, the thing that you can't quantify. Oh, it uh, it, it, it was his interview. He had a bad interview. Right. And that's, and that's why I, that's why I say that we don't get the benefit of the doubt. Right. Mm -hmm. And when something, in my opinion, minor comes up, you give the person the benefit of the doubt and the opportunity to, to offer an explanation on what took place and why it took place. And then the onus is on me to go dig that information up and, and investigate it and research it and find out, well, is this something that I can go to the hiring authority and, and honestly put my name on and go, we should hire this cat because this situation took place. Here's the explanation. I looked into it. It ain't a big deal. This, this person's going to be money for us. So again, advocacy, person actually pushing for a person of color to get hired. You have to have somebody, because of those small things that you're talking about, talking to the people who are going to make the hiring decisions going, we need to make this hire. This is a person we need to, now granted, it don't always work out that way, but on the flip side, the other thing you talk about that's important in transparency is letting the person know exactly what they're up against and why they didn't get hired. I know for a fact, and again, Taft can attest to this, I will talk to applicants and tell them, we ain't moving forward with you. Here's why. Here's what you need to do to clean that up. Come see me in X amount of months, years, or whatever the case. Because sometimes some, she, some stuff needs a, needs a few years to marinate before you can come back. This is real talk. Like, you have to get it. you got to give it like five years before you can come back. I'm serious. It's no, I mean, you know, my file, you know my file like my friends know my life. And we had to have a conversation. Yeah, we I had like a couple, a couple bro, like real. I gotta I yeah. gonna be we gonna have to delay your hire for me. I gotta do some digging and get into this. Make sure that we can work with I this. had to make I had to make some phone calls and have some uncomfortable conversations with some loved ones. But I was like, you want your brother to get the bag, you better start talking. <laughs> no, yeah, don't that don't mean I'm no gangster or nothing like that. It just means that you gotta but, work some things sometimes. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up too, because Sometimes what will happen is they'll let you in and then they'll they'll set you up to knock you down. Are you in now? And as soon as you get in, they looking for the first thing to tear you down or it was always a setup because they wanted to do X, Y, Z and make it look a certain way. And now they're trying to find the first thing they can do to show you the front door. Mm. That's also something that I had to deal with. And <laughs> I'm a, I'm a stand up dude. And it wasn't going to go down on my watch. And I made some enemies and some people got upset with me and there was some words exchanged. But I will step in front of the firing squad when I know it ain't right to protect somebody that I believe should have been getting a job to avoid them from having to deal with that. And unfortunately, I had it was coming at, every, coming at me at every angle and I couldn't block them all. So there was some shrapnel. He was taking some hits, but... For the most part, most he don't most of that shit I was taking on the chin because it was it wasn't fair and it wasn't right. You need somebody to go, hold on. You need so, to pump your brakes and get his dude a fair shot. I do want to talk about that too, because me and me and Parrish had this conversation offline. So just to not make it so law enforcement specific and just about jobs in general, I do want to talk about where you were going. Um there are cases where agencies, law enforcement, businesses, everything will look and say, this person meets the type of diversity that we need to have put out there for this level of exposure. He talks right, she talks right, they look the part, and they look like they know how to play ball with us. Um, and then on top of when all of those things happen, what you find is that there's a, there's a ceiling for you. You know what I'm saying? You may look at it like you're going to cross this picket line. Like, let me go over here and work where people wouldn't normally go to work to do something that's different or profound. But yet, ultimately, like you said, it wasn't necessarily meant for me to be as successful as I presented myself to be. 
he or she, right? Like I may have presented myself to bring all of these assets and qualities, but yet once I get here, there was a back, you know, a backdoor plan for me all along and that I wasn't supposed to be as successful as I presented to be or as they presented they wanted me to be. And like you said, that's where the Brian Flores things comes in. That's what other people in all jobs can relate to. I'm coming over here to do something because this is how it was presented to me. You also and me both know that if we read between the lines, I'm a diversity hire, but yet everything that is done is either A, to set me up for failure so that you can go back to your people and say, well, we tried, or B, I just want you here just to do this one thing. Don't talk too much. Don't say too much. Just shut up and read the script. How, how shut up and we, dribble. Yeah, shut up and dribble. How, how do we deal with that in general? Like... I don't know. I kind of just wanted to throw it out there from your point, Ernest, and then throw it to the group and see what how we feel about that. It, it's tricky because I think that what the contrarian would say is, hey, we gave you a shot, though. Right. We, we let you in. We got you. And in. you didn't you didn't meet the standard. So you can't say we didn't give you a shot because we gave you a shot. And I think that's what Ernest was speaking towards. Sometimes they let you in understanding that a situ a ship is sinking. So they will let you be the captain of the ship that they know is sinking just so they can say, Hey, we brought this black man in. He sunk, he sunk the ship, the ship. And now let's bring this other person in. And so mm -hmm. now the whole excuse of why we ain't bringing another black person. Y'all remember? Oh, buddy. Yeah. That sunk the ship. Right. So, so can't go back, to, think, that. Uh, can't you know, go back no. to that. Right. We're talking about it, it, Donald. It, it, ain't no old buddy. His name is Donald. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 see we're not allowed to sink the ship right no. you know and and i think that's the aspect of of things that happen when we show up we have to show up and be our best every single day we're not allowed to have a bad day or off day we're not allowed to have a, a, a low performance day because again there's always somebody watching to see Hey, you failed. You know what? That Ernest, you guys, I told you guys that Ernest, I told you. I see, be a problem. I seen him over there yeah. hanging out with the people in and out. He was hanging he with those one people. He's trying to get too opinionated right? over there. He's starting to talk too he much. He was over there at the in and out. He said the in and out, you stupid, bro. He was over there at the in and out with those people. You know, I seen he had a meeting. There was too many of them. I don't know yeah. about them. And, it, and it's like that. And, and that's the unfortunate thing about these spaces that we find ourselves in because some people will say, hey, it's 2022. Y'all have had a black president. You know, you know what I'm saying? And y'all have a black woman as a vice president. What are y'all talking about discrimination, man? Y'all black people, you know what y'all problem is? Y'all complain too much and y'all play the victim. Ain't no discrimination. You know who discriminated? Is? We getting discriminated. It's us, us poor white people, we getting discriminated against. What do y'all say to those people? Because to a certain degree, Tav, that's what you're talking about. It's like, okay, we get in, but then they, they try to run us out. But they saying, well, we can't get in. They letting y'all in under this diversity, equity, and inclusion. They don't like that at all. They don't yeah. like that. Yeah, that's the, that's the term that, that equity and inclusion is a term that is not very much appreciated in a lot of it's a cuss word. Yeah, <laughs> depending on who's saying it, depending on who's saying it. But, I mean, it goes back to another thing that's, and, and, and this is one, you know, it's hard to fix, but Ernest was speaking on it. He had, he, he was the voice in the room for that person that was struggling. You know what I'm saying? And that's what you need. When you leave the room, somebody needs to be speaking your truth while you're not in there. And having that advocate or that mentor makes a world of difference. Um, and I think that's missing a lot of locations. Luckily, again, though, in education, you know, it's something that's, that's spoke on, you know, a little, a little different than other areas because we're a little more liberal. It's education. But, um, what Ernest was speaking on was big. You need somebody in the room that's going to speak for you despite what's going on if you want to make sure that you do a sin and not end up being kicked out if you brought in on that, you know? Ernie, and sometimes, and, I'm sorry, but and sometimes you can get that from people who don't necessarily look like you. I'm glad you said that. I wanted to go there. Um, just but based on your work ethic, right? Okay, I know they gave me this shot because of what I look like. Watch me shine. And then one of them dudes is going to go, oh, damn. He actually good at this job. You know what? I see something or, you know, he needs an asset. Even if you don't like me, you're going to respect the job that I'm doing. So when they come in at you with, man, Ernest thing, I don't know, man, we should go ahead and get rid of me. Like, what you talking about, dude? He the only more person doing X, Y, Z and this stuff, whatever. <laughs> These dudes out here, you know, you know, shuffling and jiving. He's the only one actually working. What you mean get rid of him? I, I'll give him, let him be on my team. So right. sometimes just 
doing the job and canceling out some of that noise, you're going to get somebody's attention who don't look like you. And that person will advocate for you. And you may not even know, like real talk. I, I think real true. quick, before you go to have real quick, I want to say this because Ernest brought up this and this is a, a conversation that I constantly hear or I constantly engage in with people. Oh man, I don't want the job just because they only reason they gave it to me is because I'm black. I don't want to be nobody's token. Now nah, you looking at it from the wrong perspective. Watch me take this bad boy and just yeah. ah. Look, I'm about to take this job, but we're about to make it happen. And matter of fact, I'm about to bring two or three with me once I get in that position. I may, yeah, okay, I'm the token, whatever. But once you you make me the token, I'm gonna open up the door for three or four others who aren't the token. And I think sometimes our mindset can get a little messed up in that. It's like, oh well, they only hired me because I'm black, so I don't want it. Man, look, they may have hired that person because that person was a woman. They, they may have hired that person because they was rich. You don't know why they hired everybody. They hired somebody for a reason. And if that's the reason is your skin color, I'm still taking the job because I'm gonna show yeah. them that we can do the job greater than everybody else, not just right. as well, greater right. than everybody else. Right. It was before y'all go real quick. It was a story. I think me, I don't know if the one actually was here in Dallas yet. We was at the Omni Hotel, myself, AK, might have been Dewan and some of the other homies. You go watch the games at the Omni. I met one of the presidents of Fidelity, right? So we just chopped up. He there with his wife. And I'm not in finance or anything, but we just there. We're talking and laughing and joking, watching the game. And we're talking about the glass ceiling about my wife. She's an athletic trainer and how there's not many in the many women that serve in the NFL and NBA. Um, but we just had a conversation. He was like, Jeff, if you ever in the finance, just call me. I can find you a position mm-hmm. because the conversation we had was just that great over drinks or whatever, food, etc. But there are some people that do not look like us that are willing to take the chance on mm-hmm. you. Don't yeah. just be like, oh, he's just bluffing. No, call him or call her because yeah. they might yeah. literally put you on. <laughs> so uh, that's what I was going to kind of, well, I mean, I don't know if it's exactly what Jeff was getting to, but I was going to go back to Ernest on that one too, is, um, what are we doing that we're not being accountable for, right? Like we could get on the soapbox and say, whoa, it's me. They don't want to hire us because we black. They don't want to give us these opportunities because of this, this and that. And from your, your vantage point, someone who goes through hiring process, looking at it, looks at interviews, <laughs> things like that. And we're not talking about just police stuff. We're talking about, because these people come to you as applicants. Not all of them have been police before. Sure. What is it that we in general don't take enough accountability for that, we don't really want to talk about, right? Where it's like, you can't say that because now you just an uncle, whoever, or you're not keeping it real, or you don't have our back. What is that thing that you need to see in us, whether it's older generation, newer generation, what are we not being accountable for that would make us ready and more prepared for these situations? You know, I, it's interesting because it's like, uh, I guess the best way to answer that question would be, people aren't taking a lot of responsibility for their own, for their actions and their, the things that they've done in the past, right? They're trying to uh, sweep some things under the rugs or keep some, basically, you know, when you get into, and I hate to bring back to law enforcement, but when you get into law enforcement, you go through a background process, your life, is, it's, it's invasive. They're going to open your stuff up and take a real good look at it. If you put every, I tell my kids all the time, if you walk into a room and you've done something wrong and you tell them, hey, that's my fault. I messed up. It's on me. I'm going to try not to let it happen again. You can't get yelled at. You done sucked all that out the room. They, there's no reason for them to be mad at you anymore because you've acknowledged the mistake. You've talked about how you've become a better person, what you learned from it, and what you're going to do moving forward. I think that's one of the way, one of the areas that we as a, coming into jobs don't do enough of. Yeah, you might have got arrested before. For something poo but whatever and you're trying to get a job with the city as a janitor and you don't tell them well you ain't gonna get the job when they find out <laughs> right but if you had told them up front and say hey you know what in 1988 i got you know a dui arrest but since then i've been sober clean i don't drink my driving record's impeccable blah 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 okay thank you very much mr so-and-so here's you know here's your opportunity i just because honestly a lot of the times it ain't that big. It ain't a big deal. It really ain't. It's like, it's life. It happens to everybody, white, black, or other. And if you just upfront about and about what's going on and you take some responsibility and accountability and ownership of it, you don't still get afforded that opportunity um, by somebody who doesn't look like you because they don't appreciate the honesty. They'll be like, oh, they, okay, cool. Here you go. Here's your chance. And then like, Dewan said, you run with it, you shine. And the next thing you know, 
you bring it in Taft, and then you bring it in Paris, and then now Jeff's hot, and then you got, and then so on and so on. You just keep paying it forward. Um, and then when you look around, you start seeing a lot more people that look like you in positions of power and authority that can now reach back and bring you up along too. So I think that's one of the things that's missing. I think one of the things I'll say too is like being where I was with you is that um, at the time I was there, it felt like it was Chocolate City. It was a very minority based place, right? You got a black chief, black assistant chief, black lieutenants, black captains, black sergeants. Every patrol team has a ratio of at least 2.3.2, 2, 2.5 to 3.3 African Americans, whether male or female, on that team. I was going to say, don't forget about my female hires. I've been yeah, no, no, that's why I said females <laughs> too. And then that's not even including the Hispanic base there, the LGBT community, uh, BTQ plus community is represented there. I was in a situation that, um, although it could be harsh at times, um, when I got my hand slapped or I need to be corrected about something or somebody had to check me about something, right? Setting probably nine times, eight times out of 10, I was getting checked by a minority who could have been my uncle or who could have been my dad or who could have been my auntie or who could have been my mom or who could have been my older cousin or at least my peer cousin that went off to college first that I look up <laughs> to. So it was totally, um, and, I, I, and I really appreciate that now, right? It's like one of the biggest things that I miss the most in just my current setting and just in general. But what I will say is that even in the process of getting there, right, that was like playing on a Super Bowl team and being a rookie and you being like, I don't know what it's like to play in the big dance. And so you, but you got a whole bunch of people that's like, act like you've been here before and they could support you, right? I had a whole bunch of people around me that knows what it's like to play in this setting that could mentor that and help me in a situation where at times it felt very overwhelming. Because once again, we're talking about you and I mean, it's public record, so it ain't no reason to not talk about it. We're talking about you changing my life from a $47,000 a year first police opportunity to a $100,000 a year uh, opportunity. So what I'm saying is that the moment sometimes could be too big and be overwhelming and make you question, how can you how can I get through that? I will say that for me, looking at how that could affect the rest of the people and how I'm trying to tie it in is that. Sometimes I think in our shortcomings as people, as we try to ascend and get better job opportunities, high paying job opportunities, or we put ourselves in position to play in the big leagues, if you don't have that support system, it can be really, really hard. So even being that one to be like, man, they only hired me because I'm black. And, you know, in contrast to what Dewan said, I could really see why people might feel like, man, they only hired me like this and it's hard for me to do it because if you don't have that support system and force around you to push you forward and you playing in the big dance, how do you know how to go win a Super Bowl and you all never have that support to do it? And I'm not saying that to say that it's an excuse, but I'm saying that I could see how it happened because I've watched people wash themselves out of hundred thousand dollar a year jobs that just didn't have that support or didn't know how to make it all click. I think to answer the question, Tab, and to kind of go into what you said, I think one of the biggest things that we don't do sometimes is the networking the relationship building along the way not not once you're there when you know you want to get there i you mm -hmm. know i want to work for x xyz hospital i didn't found the, the the director the president the department head of the department i want to apply to on linkedin reached out connected then started that relationship so then when they when they see my application they knew it and now that i'm in there i'm in the hospital i'm i'm, I'm networking i'm not having lunch by myself i'm trying to figure out okay who can i have lunch with who can i talk to who can I build relationships with? Because you are only as strong as your support system. I don't really care what environment you're in, right? You could be the smartest person in the room, but no one knows it because you don't have support. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes one of the biggest things that we forget to do in any situation is build those relationships. We we, we do this thing. Oh, we're going to go to work. We're going to put our head down and just do our job. Okay. That's only going to get you that job. But if you want to ascend and you want to grow and you want to be a part of the decisions that control your job, you need to develop relationships. And I think sometimes that's a part of us that we're unwilling to do is develop those relationships. I mean, I think that's all it is. It's, it's really networking because a lot of, uh, I think what everybody do is still some form of customer service. So you got to be a people person in some form or fashion. I don't care what you do in life. You almost are doing customer services at, at some point. So you got to recreate those relationships. And from what I, I would assume a lot of us know is, is 
it's not always what you know, but who you know. I think that's what you're getting at, Dewan. And so you shake those right hands. Um, they put you in the right place to do those right projects or engage in those right individuals to get you to that next level. I mean, again, circling back to education, uh, the degree is great. A lot of people have the degree, though, because it's education. We all got degrees. We all know what we're talking about. And then after a while, it's like, well, what's next? Well, how many committees have you been on? Well, I'm on just as many committees as you are on. All right. So then what's next? Well, I hope do these projects. Well, so did everybody else. So now it becomes a like, who do I know that's close to this situation that can help me out or give me these answers? And I think that applies to everybody's job. I mean, that's how I got to where I'm at. And I think that's how a majority of us maneuver in this world. You got to know who you need to know. A lot of that happens, like not just sitting, like Dewan said, during lunchtime by yourself. You actually got to find out who else is in the room. Well, then there is time. No, but that's so, that's so crazy. That's against all the stuff that they was taught as kids. I grew up in A. Always. Always. Yeah, bro, it's literally against everything I was taught. It was like, all right, go to school. Get a degree. Get two. Get three. I got three. It ain't enough, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> now you got to talk to everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it ain't just that, bro. You need more than that paperwork. But that's what I'm saying. There, that Then there is two different uh, higher man, He ain't got no paperwork, but he owns. I'm on. <laughs> I'm on. But that's but that's it. There's two different hiring hiring Americas, basically. Then that's what I'm saying, right? I can everything you guys said that we're saying to do. If your pigmentation is a little bit lighter and the equator didn't hit you and your bloodline just right, you don't have to go through them same things that we're talking about. Because I can everything that y'all say. Yo, your skin tone is a little lighter. What you talking about? Like, right. What, what you talking about? Me, me, I, me, and Ernest the only ones who was, who was, who was from under the equator, my brother. What you talking? That's, that's the divided cocker that they got going on right now. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is this: when we sit next to counterparts and everything that y'all just said right now, if they're non-minority, everything that y'all just said doesn't exist. I can sit next to another person, and maybe not. I'm not speaking particularly where I worked at with Ernest, but I'm speaking in other places that I've worked in. And since and nobody gonna box me in because it's my I've had three police jobs, so we don't know what agency I'm talking about. But I've sat in other places where Joe Schmo comes right in and he did just go to school <laughs> and he did just apply and he did just get the job. He ain't do nothing else. He ain't right, <laughs> he don't know much about much, he just know that he went to school, went to the academy, and he got the job and he's here. That's not, when we're talking about our hiring America, whether it is going to work at a college, how many committees you getting on? That's what P talking about right now. When you're talking about you and Jeff right now, applying to the hospital, knowing somebody at the hospital, hanging out, doing some things, figuring out what their strengths and weaknesses are and how the people that you're networking with ultimately are gonna lead towards you showing them that you're an asset and to give you a shot because you might be able to dribble further than the rest of them. Jeff's situation, you got to go in there and not just be an investigator. You got to do X, Y, and Z on top of that to get there, too. You got to actually be in a position like him to be wanted so much that they turn down some stuff. Or you turn down some stuff just to boost your stock up. No one else outside of that has to do that. This is our hiring America we're talking about. And it doesn't exist for everybody else. And so I just look at this whole picture and I say, do I ever think it's going to necessarily get better? Are we sitting here on our soapbox trying to whine today? I don't really give a damn about that. that. If this is what it is, then I just wanted us to have a transparent conversation and say, hey, all of us have traveled that route. All of us probably will continue to travel that route. And we just got to live in our truth um, as being minorities and knowing that this is what it's going to be. This is what it looks like. Ain't no free rides and handouts out here. What you must do is create enough network like the rest of us have done so that when somebody starts, for lack of a better term, screwing with you, you have enough allies and networks to be like, I'm not the person you want to play with. I, I don't have to be here like that. Mm -hmm. No matter what you say, what you try to do, what shit you try to put in my jacket, I got enough friends in high places now to be like, oh, this ain't the only tree I get I get my fruit from. But yeah, that's yeah. being indispensable. That's being indispensable right there. That's indispensability right there. If that's yeah, you worth. created your worth. That's what it is. You're creating yeah. your worth. You have to. You, you, you got to. It, that's the only way to survive in a lot of these games. If you, if you don't know how to create your storyline and your narrative, yeah, people gonna make it up for you, and that's how you end up losing out. So, and if you just show up and you feel like just applying for a job, it's ain't enough. reached out to nobody, ain't made no connection. Sometimes it's gonna be enough, but majority of the time, won't you just take the next step? I, 
so much of what we need to do to continue to advance in the ways that we have. Think about it, y'all. We've come so far as a people. One, we have to make sure we're reaching back and pulling somebody with us or who look like true. us, right? Now, that doesn't mean we can't pull other people who don't look like us, but you damn sure want to ensure some of the people that you pull and look like you because then they can pull people that look like you. And now you see the, 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 the color in this building start to look a little different, right? Which means the opportunities for the company to grow and in insight changes too because we all live in different Americas, right? And our culture influences our decision-making and, and, and what we learn and how we operate. And so what people don't understand is companies will always do better when they have more black people at the seat of the table, simply because our perspectives are going to be able to look at things from a different different uh, view. Same as if they have women at the table, people of the LBGTQ community, the more diversity you have, the better you will always be. But I do think, though, we have to put emphasis on our children and then younger people coming up to ensure that they are not looking to be victims, that they're looking to put themselves in winning situations by communicating, by networking, right? You either be chose or you choose someone. So you're either going to be chosen and end up going down a job or a career path that you don't want, or you're going to knock down that door, whether it's with the police department, the fire department, whatever department it is that you're trying to get into until they open the door for you. Because at some point they're going to just let you in because they're tired of you showing up. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, yeah, I'll, I'll save it for later, but you know, we also growing up in a, a a society now that's been doing this and kids that's been doing this. All they do is being in front of a computer so they don't know how to engage with people accordingly. And I only speak on that and the importance now of that networking because I have a living situation. My son, you know, he attends LSU and uh, he's at second semester and he's like, you know what? I think I want a job. And he's found a job on his own, but at the same time, he's like, oh, that job's not what I'm interested in. I need to do something else. Networking. Hey, Jeff, you got somebody at LSU? Yeah, I do know somebody that works at LSU. Jaden, call Jeff. Jeff is going to tell you what to do and who to talk to in order to get in that room. Here's where his circle are all the way around. After their conversation, Jaden was like, wait, I applied to that same place. And at first they didn't call me. Now they gave me a call to come in. Hmm. Who you know makes a big difference. And Jaden was like, now nah, I got an interview on Monday. And I don't know if I would have got that interview if I didn't make the necessary phone calls. And I'm only bringing that up because now when we're talking about the younger society, this is what they know. They've been in front of computer screens. So it's like, how do you network well? No, and, and you, you gotta, gotta take get, care. You gotta get out there and do it. You gotta take care of your people on the top, uh, on the top of your age ba- uh, bracket and the All bottom. The way of your down. Yep. I'm I'm that same situation happening with the agency where Lucas is at. I mean, Ernest is at. I literally <laughs> that first time around a couple of years ago, that didn't come through. Actually, it was like four or five. And when the person that brought me brought it to me, like, man, you should think about coming there, I was like, man. I'm not going there. I ain't, <laughs> I ain't doing none of that. You know, it, it's so, a lot. But, of but and here's the difference between like how some things get done and how you probably should do them. When I found out that he was interested, I went and met him at a at a at a, at a um, at an event that was completely unrelated to where I work, and yeah. introduced myself, got his information. Was like, I heard you was interested. He was like, Yeah. I'm like, Let's find a time to talk, come in, do some ride along, whatever. So that networking started there, but mm-hmm. I had, I didn't, he didn't reach out to me. I went to him because I knew what I was looking for. So you do need, and I'm, most companies should have somebody of color or of a different, you know, in a, in a community, so to speak, as a, on a, on a hiring pool, you know, doing some of the recruiting, but they don't. And that's what he missing out on all of this untapped talent. Like, and I'm not saying that he wouldn't have got hired if someone else was in the position that I was in at the time. I just don't know if they would have worked as hard to make sure it happened. Like, yeah. he still probably would have got a shot. And then it would have got to the point where, like, ah, I don't feel like doing all this extra shit for this dude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's too yeah. hard. But the full, circle, the full circle of it all is what you're talking about. I mean, two, three weeks ago, I, I find out you made lieutenant. I go through whatever, you know, my job comes with a lot of ups and downs wherever it is that I'm at right now. I find out you made lieutenant. I walk into the building, even with the little bullshit I'm seeing, like, you know what? We made lieutenant around here. (laughs) (laughs) If if, if it's going to go down, it's going to go down. Because you know what? We made lieutenant around here. But it's just that thing, though. Your win is my win, right? Like, despite whatever happened and the things that go on, you know, all jokes aside, your win is my win. I started in this group with you. 
I've networked, I've done the work, I did the due diligence, you pulled back, you made sure that you mentored, because it's full circle, right? We got black people that watch the show all the way from, you know, our senior uh, category to our, you know, kids watching this. So we're just trying to show how it goes full circle. You put out that effort, I put out that effort, both of us have made advances. And now if things happen to us in life that aren't, you know, damn near catastrophic, we're in a position to be of assets to each other and continue to create that security around each other. Your win is my win. I see what happens with you and I hear about those things. I go to work with my head held a little bit higher, even though I'm just a patrol officer, but I feel that much more of a shield or that much more of my armor on me because I know I do the right things at the end of the day. And I know that when I need something, if something ever came to time, I have at least someone I can reach out and say, hey, this is my situation. What are the possibilities of you can you can basically fix this for me? Can you snoop dog me off of death row and let me go be out there with you and Master P and No Limit Records? <laughs> nice. It's about who you know. It's about who you know. Well, before we, we before we exit, you know, Ernest, what 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 words of wisdom do you have for maybe young people out there who decide, hey man, I want to get into law enforcement? What are some of the things that you feel that they need to do, or some advice that you have for them? I, I need for them. I need for them to want to get into law enforcement. That's what I need. That's a huge issue right now with what's taking place in the world over the past couple of years. Um, there's been just a, a, an overall disinterest in in law enforcement. But you can't affect any change if you're on the outside looking in. Period. Right? You. I don't like this. I don't like that. Okay. Cool. You got to get into it and start making little small changes. Like if you truly can. If, you truly care about the community that you may live around or live in being in law enforcement is the best way to serve it because mm -hmm. you tap into so many different things. Yeah. I'm out there making sure that people are being, you know, are safe. I'm out here addressing actual, you know, criminal activity, but then I also get to touch the children at every stage, elementary school, middle school, high school, mm -hmm. and I can become a mentor to those kids or grown people who are out there on a, you know, street corner on a daily basis, Wasting away when they could be, you know, home raising their kids and being a father, whatever the case may be. There's just so many, you know, branches that, that come off of this law enforcement tree, and young people don't see those opportunities because of the negativity that the, 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 the profession gets, which is, it is warranted. I ain't going to, you know, sugarcoat it. There's some definitely bad apples out there, and they're going to get what they got coming to them, and it is what it is. <laughs> I ain't got no problem with that. You do something stupid, you pay the cancer consequences. Don't take my cornbread. But point is, though, it's like if I can get those young people to at least apply, I can walk them through how to get the job. Maybe you don't get it the first time because you don't have enough college credits. Hey, go online, take two English courses and a math course because you're going to need that because you got to be able to write reports and you got to be able to balance your checkbook. So <laughs> when you get this job, go do that. You're going to get the units you need. Then come see me. I'm going to put you on ride alongs. I'm, I'll hire you as a cadet. You, you can get a whole lot of police officer experience part time in a civilian position, and then I'll, I'll send you to the academy and pay for you to go. There's so many different ways, but young people just aren't interested, and in, it's tough getting them to want to get involved and apply. If they did, um, yeah, it'd be it we we all be better off for it because we'd have more people who cared enough about it. To make sure that bad things don't happen like George Floyd. That, that wouldn't happen if there was more black people working in that city. Facts. Yeah, period. Wow. Facts. Wow. Hey, and on that note, we're going to holla. Appreciate <laughs> you guys. All right, I appreciate y'all having me. Thank you very much. <laughs>